sick of Powell's memory because she had always intended to be a missionary. And I know that when we gave the invitation at the end of the play, the young man named Rodney Ripple said, I'm surrendering to be a missionary. And a young lady named Becky Swain said, I'm surrendering to be a missionary. And I know that they got married and they finished school and they went off to Cambodia and been there 14 or 15 years doing a wonderful work for God. I don't know all God was doing, but I know some things He was doing. Faith. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Second part is forgiveness. You know, whenever redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. God's grace makes him forgive us. If we respond to others in grace, we must forgive them. Now, you say, I know, I know you gotta forgive and forget. No, I'm not gonna tell you that. You can't. Your mind is constructed so you can never really forget anything. You can't always remember what you want to remember when you want to remember. But it's still in there. Like the fellow I heard about, somebody said, how are you doing? He said, I'm better since I've been taking this medicine. He said, what are you taking? He said, it's, um, it's, um, he said, what's a flower? It's red, it smells pretty, it's got thorns on it. Oh, he said, Rose? Yeah, yeah. He said, hey, Rose, what's that medicine I've been taking? <laughs> are not that bad, most of us. But it comes to you. It may come to you at 3 in the morning, but it comes to you. You can never forget it. Forgiveness is not forgetting. God forgets. He remembers our sins no more. Let me give you the best definition of forgiveness I've ever read. Forgiveness is agreeing to live with the unchangeable consequences of another's sin against me. Sometimes we call that acceptance. Agreeing to live with the unchangeable consequences of another's sin against me. Now, forgiveness does not mean forgetting, but I'll tell you what it does mean. It does mean that when you say, God, I forgive that person, and God, I'm, I'm done with it, I'm not going to hold it against it, I'm going to agree to live with the unchangeable consequences that come as a result of their wrong behavior. It does mean that you never bring it up again. That's what it does mean. But here's the third part that will seem a little different. I said you have to have faith, you have to have forgiveness. The third part is you have to fight. James 4 says we wrestle. I'm sorry. James 4 says resist the devil. He will flee from you. Ephesians 6 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. The, the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see, the battle for victory or failure, success or the lack thereof in your Christian life is always fought in your mind. Whoever controls your mind controls you. And the battle for victory over bitterness is going to come in your mind. It's going to, not going to come one time. You may kneel at an altar tonight and promise God to deal with it spiritually, but you'll have to do it a thousand times. It may spring up before you get in the car, man. It may spring up before you go to bed. It may spring up five or six times a month. And every time you have to go back and answer it with Scripture. It's a fight. Bob Jones Sr. said, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head. Now he meant by that, there are thoughts that come in your mind, you can do nothing about the fact that they have come there. Not every thought that comes in your mind is your fault. The Bible teaches us that the devil can put thoughts in our mind. He can't read our mind, but he can put thoughts in our mind. That's what Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira. Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie against the Holy Ghost? The Bible says that it's the devil, Satan, moved against David to number the people. So the devil would not be in your mind. Bob Jones Jr. said you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair. My method is to give him very little material. <laughs> With which to work. How do you resist the devil? 
Well, the Lord Jesus was tempted by the devil. You know the story. And he could have done anything he wanted. He could have just told the devil to shut up and go back where he belonged. But it's interesting. And anything our Lord said was, by definition, the Word of God. Okay? And then Jesus said is the Word of God. He's God. But he all, in every circumstance, every instance, these three times, each of the three times, he referred back to written scripture. On to turn these stones into bread. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Well, I don't you jump off the temple because the Bible says you'll not suffer to dash your foot against the stone. No, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Well, I'll tell you what. And he took it to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, all oh, this shall be thine. If thou wilt bow down and worship me, that was a legitimate offer. He is the prince of the power of the air. The offer essentially was you can have the crown without the cross. You can have the glory without having to go through the grief. And the Lord Jesus said, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. Three times He was tempted. Three times He answered with the Word of God. Now, I won't take time to develop it, but here's what you better do. If you want to have victory, if you want to have the, the ability to overcome bitterness, you're going to deal with wrong thoughts in your life, you get you some scripture that answers the wrong thought. See, just because you think something doesn't make it true. <laughs> well, I think, well, I don't care. I don't care what you think. I'm not interested in what I think. I want my mind to be governed by what the Word of God says. The Bible says that the Word of Christ dwell in you richly speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I would suggest you, and I so appreciate it, that a similar emphasis in Brother Whitaker's message when he talked about Jesus up in our conversation. And Jesus ought to be part of our life. If you in your conversation don't quote Scripture, if the Bible doesn't come up as an answer to a question, if you don't find a Bible principle guiding you as you make decisions, it is because there's not enough Bible in you. Let it dwell in you richly. So you get some verses. You say, you get this attitude, I'll never make it. Well, just memorize, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, we'll never get to succeed. We'll never see revival. We'll never get the building paid off. We'll never get this, this project taken care of. We'll never have this victory. Well, the Bible says, in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Amen. You say, well, it's just not fair. I said, never take it like that. It's just not right. Well, I got a verse for that. Romans 6, 23. The way to sin is death. You want to be fair? You have to die and go to hell. That's fair. That's what we deserve. And, and, and every time that that thought comes, you must answer with Scripture. And it'll spring up and you answer. It'll spring up and you answer. And you don't fight the devil. You don't say, I'm not going to listen to that word. Hang on, I'm going to get out of my car. Get out of my house. No, no. You answer with the Word of God. The only weapon that we're given offensively in our armor is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I am convinced Christians don't know the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They don't use the Bible. The Bible is just a nice little decoration they put in their arm when they come to church. It is the reference book from which the sermons are taken. It is the place we get our Sunday school lessons. But friends, it is way more than that. It is a lamp at our feet and a light at our path. It is God's divine path and plan for our lives. Everything I know about God, I know from this book. Everything I need to know about life, about how to treat my wife, about how to raise my children, about how to deal with my enemies, about how to respond to my friends, about how to spend my money, about how to overcome temptation, I find in the Word of God, and you'll never, never, never have long-term success until you fill your mind with the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Now, you may not know the right verses for your problems. You go to your pastor, he'll help you. A young lady years ago had been violated in the most awful way. She went to her pastor and he gave her some difficult but biblical advice. He told her that the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, You've heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you that you love your enemy. That's not what you want to hear, is it? But then he went on to show her what the Lord Jesus said you needed to do in order to love your enemies. Because the Lord Jesus went on and said, Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despite.